Now let's look at the way in which Hartree-Fock theory is generally used in practice to predict uh, orbital energies and the total energies of atoms. And this is called the Hartree-Fock-Rotan procedure or the Hartree-Fock-Rotan equations. So we have our operators from before. We have our one electron operator, little h, which for each electron in a given orbital i will have some kinetic energy uh, here and will have some attraction to the nucleus, uh, potential energy attraction to the nucleus with a charge of z, number of protons being the integer z. And we have our two electron operators, the Coulomb and exchange operators. The Coulomb operator being the interaction of electron one with electron two in some different orbital, its charge density uh, interacting with electron one through the Coulomb operator, the repulsion of those two electrons. And then due to the anti-symmetry requirements of the wave function, due to the way that the Slater determinant wave function is constructed, uh, the thing that also falls out of the energy expression are these exchange uh, operators, and you get these exchange uh, integrals. And this is not really interpretable classically, but uh, you can see by the math here, basically there's an exchanging of the indices i and j here as far as which orbitals electron 1 and electron 2 are in. There's an exchanging of electrons going on there to satisfy the anti-symmetry principle or the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, and that gave us our Fock operator, which was a sum of, for an individual electron, it's one electron operator, and then the sum over all of the other electrons of its two electron operators, uh, the Coulomb minus exchange. Okay, and for each given orbital, the orbital is an eigenfunction of the Fock operator, and that gives back some orbital energy times uh, the orbital back itself. Okay, but we haven't mentioned anything about what the form of these orbitals uh, takes what the functional form looks like. So in uh, this type of procedure, what we'd have is that a specific orbital, psi i of r1, would, let's say psi i of r1, would equal some linear combination uh, of what we would call basis functions. Basis functions we've seen before, a basis set is just a way to expand a problem uh, in terms of a specific set of guess functions. So we have a sum over uh, this new equals one up to k with there being k basis functions. And then you have a coefficient c for um, the new, for basis function new in orbital i, so c new i, times a basis function phi of new, which is a function of R1. Okay, so what type of functions should we expand these wave functions in terms of? Well, for atoms, we know that we can solve the hydrogen atom exactly. Uh, you, we can solve that uh, given its exact Hamiltonian, the Schrodinger equation, and we can get uh, the atomic orbitals for hydrogen back from that. So things that look like the atomic orbitals of hydrogen are probably a pretty good starting guess for other types of orbitals. And in fact, that's what we're going to do. We're going to use things that look like hydrogen uh, atom orbitals and just vary them slightly in order to be able to capture our new wave functions in this type of form. Those, they're not going to be exactly looking like this because we now have the interaction of the electrons with each other. If it was only one electron terms interacting, they would look pretty much exactly like the hydrogen atom. But these two electron terms, these 1 over R1, 2 operators, kind of muck things up a little bit. So we have to uh, use uh, expansions like this to approximate the solution instead. OK, so one form, which, is very com which could be very commonly used, usually more in uh, smaller type of problems, would be what we call a Slater orbital. And this would have some normalization constant then x to some power, y to some power, z to some power, and then we have e to the minus zeta r, where zeta is some exponent, which depends on whatever uh, we pick for that given basis function. And having this e to the minus zeta r in there, that's called a Slater function. If you want an s orbital, you just have set a, b, and c equal to zero. You just have some constant times e to the minus zeta r. 
and if you wanted some higher angular momentum function, you would pick some higher value. You would pick some non-zero value of a, b, and c. If you wanted something that was a p or a d or an f function, you would pick something different there. Then, what we could also use, which is what is much more commonly used in practice, is called a Gaussian orbital, and or a Gaussian basis function which would be the same type of uh, pre-factor here, normalization constant, and then some powers of x, y, and z. Then you have e to the minus zeta r squared, and that would be called a Gaussian basis function. Now we know that the atomic orbitals of hydrogen all decay like this e to the minus zeta r. They all decay uh, exponentially like this, like Slater orbitals. So why is it that Gaussian orbitals are used more in practice? And the answer to that is that uh, generally these are done in computer programs because there's a lot of math involved. There very quickly becomes quite a lot of work to do once you get once you go beyond a helium atom or so. And these uh, two electron integrals here uh, the Coulomb and exchange integrals are going to become very difficult uh, when you have Slater orbitals. And it turns out there's some nice uh, mathematical simplifications that happen when you use Gaussian orbitals and it's just much easier to, to work with. So you can actually uh, get a calculation which will run faster using a larger number of Gaussian orbitals rather than a smaller number of more accurate Slater orbitals. Okay, so when we do that then Oh, one more other, one more note here. Um, these exponent powers here, this a plus b plus c, uh, you can notice these exponents here on the x, y, and z. The total uh, angular momentum of a function is just going to be a sum of this a plus b plus c. So if you want an s orbital, you set these all equal to zero, and then you have a spherically symmetric function, just like e to the minus zeta r or e to the minus zeta r squared. If you want something that looks like a p orbital, you can actually work out that you can express p orbitals in this form that you can have uh, if just any l which equals 1, so either pick a, b, or c to be 1 and the others are 0. You can get the px, py, and pz orbitals by setting either a, b, or c equal to 1 respectively. Then d orbitals are combinations in which l equals 2, f orbitals are combinations in which l, f, in which l equals 3, and it gets a little bit more complicated how you have to represent them in order to get the type of uh, spherical harmonic representation that we were talking about before, but it's all pretty much uh, one mathematical transformation away. And uh, you can, this is, would be called a Cartesian expression of the basis set doing it this way but it's a, it's a straightforward mathematical transformation to get them to the type of spherical harmonics that we were looking at with the hydrogen atom. Okay, so if we look at what happens now when we express the Fock operator acting on this wave function, we'll see that we have sum of nu equals 1 all the way up to k total basis functions the coefficient for basis function nu in orbital i for phi nu of r1 it's then going to equal some ah it's a terrible epsilon it's going to equal some orbital energy epsilon i times r atomic orbital back c nu i phi nu of R1. Okay, that fit. That's good. So now you can take this if we have our uh, psi i here. If we multiply on the left here by a psi star i and then integrate over uh, d cubed R1, let's write some simplification. Let's write some integrals here. We can say we have f mu nu, which is going to be an integral that looks like the integral over all of the spatial coordinates of electron 1 basis function phi star mu complex conjugate of basis function mu times the Fock operator acting on basis function nu so mu and nu being two uh, not necessarily the same basis functions could be two different basis functions 
And over here, we would get that would be the type of integral we'd get by multiplying by uh, phi star over here and integrating. If we multiply by our psi star for a given orbital over here and integrate, you'll have integrals which look like what we're going to call s mu nu, where we have the integral d cubed r1 phi star mu phi nu. And these integrals should look somewhat familiar. When we talked about the linear variational method, we saw that we had uh, Hamiltonian matrix elements uh, in terms of uh, in terms of integrals like these, like uh, wave uh, wave function psi star uh, times h acting on the wave function gave us Hamiltonian matrix elements. Well, in this case, the Fock operators are effective Hamiltonian. So we have basically the Fock operator is going to be represented for this basis set in terms of a matrix. And these matrix elements of this Fock matrix is going to be f mu nu, which are integrals like these. And similarly, <clears throat> in the linear variational method, we had overlap integrals, which did look just like this. They were the integral over the entire domain of the wave function of psi star psi. And the s, the overlap of all of our basis functions is again represented in a matrix s mu nu, whose elements are uh, these s mu nu, where the uh, mu will be the rows and the nu will be the columns. And again, in terms of the linear variational method, um, the hartree fock rotan equations are a linear variational method for um, these type of atomic orbital basis sets for the hartree fock equations. And our linear variational parameters are going to be these coefficients, these c nu i, the coefficient of basis function nu in orbital i. And there's going to end our individual atomic orbitals are going to be represented as a vector of these coefficients. So this should all bring back uh, familiarities to the linear variational method and uh, when we uh, went through that discussing that in terms of approximate methods for solving a uh, quantum mechanical system for which we can't solve the Schrodinger equation exactly. Okay so when we substitute in these integrals where we've multiplied by uh, psi star and integrated, we get equations which will look like this, where we have the sum of nu of c nu i of f times f mu nu equals epsilon i, the orbital energy for uh, atomic orbital i, times the sum over nu c nu i s mu nu. Okay, so these type of equations here, once we uh, transform that and go down to this step, can be represented in the same way that we end up getting to the linear variational method and the secular determinant, uh, looking at the linear variational method. We have the Fock matrix F, whose elements are these F mu nu integrals, times the vector C, which represents a vector of these basis function coefficients which represent a single atomic orbital for some atom equals some orbital energy epsilon times our overlap matrix s these integrals of phi star mu phi nu times again the uh, vector of coefficients of our atomic orbital basis function. So our atomic orbital represented in terms of a vector of these basis set coefficients. Okay, and again this is the same kind of pseudo eigenvalue problem we have here. If you have if you have uh, a, a set of orthonormal basis functions then this S matrix becomes an identity matrix and you just have FC equals epsilon C which is again a matrix form of our Schrodinger equation H psi equals E psi. Okay, so these are what we would call the hartree fock rotan equations, this matrix form of our representation for solving for our atomic orbitals in a basis set of these kind of guess functions here. And in terms of this method, uh, we have k basis functions. So the Fock matrix and the overlap matrix 
would be k by k matrices. And we would have k total orbitals. And we have the number of electrons we have. We would have n occupied spin orbitals if we have n electrons. A spin orbital just being some orbital with a unique set of of quantum numbers so in terms of a spatial orbital and then a value of spin spin up or spin down and so those would be occupied spin orbitals or orbitals with an electron in them and then you would have k minus n uh, virtual orbitals or virtual spin orbitals or unoccupied orbitals orbitals which do not have an electron in them. 